Hello and welcome to this presentation on Processing Pi, otherwise known as Python Mode for Processing. My name is Tristan Bunn. I'm an interactive media lecturer at Massey University in New Zealand, and I've switched between industry and academia quite a few times in my career. In addition to that, I started as a designer and I moved further and further into development along the way. So I'm really fascinated by this whole intersection of code and art. I'm interested in processing Pi for teaching and creative practice. And in this brief overview of processing's Python mode, I am going to review some history around the sort of creative coding scene as well as uh, review processing, specifically Python mode. Uh, I'll point you to some documentation and resources you can take a look at. And I'll also share a bunch of inspirational projects along the way. So kind of going backwards in time, I'm going to begin with crack intros. So if you are not familiar with these, the idea is that um, early on, like in the 80s, when hackers started cracking copy protection on games and other software, they would put a little slide at the beginning when you started the program saying crack by Dr. Micro and what other messages they wanted to leave. So over time, these became more and more elaborate. So this one over here is also for the Apple II uh, for a game Beast War from 1984. And as you can see over here, uh, there's now some images, uh, some fancy fonts, uh, more elaborate quotes. And what started to happen was this became a competitive thing. Crackers wanted to see who could kind of make the most elaborate crack intro screens. And as time went on, these things became more and more elaborate as hardware became more powerful and also as hackers kind of pushed themselves to do more fancy things. Uh, this doesn't have any movement in it because it's just a screenshot. But what you have over here is these letters moving in kind of an elliptical motion. And generally speaking, these crack intros would include uh, audio, chip tune type kind of music. Uh, and generally speaking, a lot of patterns, a lot of colors. And what the hackers were trying to do here was squeeze as much performance as possible out of the hardware to make it do really impressive multimedia things. Uh, anyway. This whole crack intro thing kind of turned into an art form of its own. And what you started to get was these things called demos, which were basically uh, programs that you would download that would run a whole crack intro style demo with all sorts of fancy graphics and audio. And the idea was not to sort of just sit in front of some cracked piece of, uh, of software, but to be a piece unto itself. I think one of the most famous examples of uh, a demo from the demo scene is this one called Second Reality, which I think is about 10 minutes long. Uh, you can watch it on YouTube or you can download the program and then try and run it in some emulated system on your modern machine. Um, but it's a really good example of this whole scene and what programmers were trying to do. Uh, and as you can see here, it was created by Future Crew in 1993. Now, it was actually created for an event called the assembly. And what happens is at assembly, it's usually an annual event, you have a whole bunch of geeks who get together and program the most impressive demos that they can. Um, of course, these days, it's much easier to get computers to do really elaborate spinning graphics and music and all the rest of it. So very often you'll have in these competitions some kind of parameters that you have to work within. So for example, can your demo fit into 1K or 4K and things like this. Uh, of course, this whole idea of programming a computer to sort of generate patterns and things isn't anything new. And even though these artists didn't use computers, they were kind of thinking in the same way come up with a method to generate things and then generate as many of those things as you can. And a lot of creative coding applications these days work on this kind of generative principle where you make something that makes something. So if you take a look here at this example by Paul Clay or this one over here by Kandinsky, 
and this Jackson Pollock on the right hand side uh, and you look at a lot of kind of algorithmic and generative art these days you can see how they are very much related in terms of outlook and approach. Uh, of course computer art itself um, goes way back um, to even before there were sort of computer screens that could present uh, good looking graphics. So for example on the left hand side we have a Manfred Moore and on the right hand side we have a, a Frieda Neck and they were basically using plotters to print these things. So just to give you some idea early printers were like typewriters they would have a whole bunch of die cast little letter forms that would stamp ink onto a piece of paper but if you wanted to break away from just printing text you would use something like a plotter which has an x and a y axis and some kind of drawing to in this case just a pen and your computer would send the x y coordinates to this and the position of the pen can move about to draw different types of shapes Anyway, my first introduction to this whole creative coding thing was Flash. For those of you who can remember Flash, huge on the internet um, maybe 10 years ago, and now looking to be called off by Adobe because other technologies have kind of taken over. But the great thing about Flash was it gave you the ability to do all sorts of things that you couldn't do in your browser 10 years ago. Add animations, add audio, add video. And even program games so you might have played Quop which is a really frustrating game where you have to control the limbs of this character to make him run as far as you can using your Q, W, O and P keys. Uh, Flash itself was an animation program with all these kind of extra programming abilities so if you've ever used some kind of uh, animation software before you would have seen something that's got a timeline and you can position where things are at different points in time. And the idea is that the computer can calculate how to move things between different coordinates so you don't have to stop frame and draw each and every position. Now what Flash did was they added this panel called the Action Script panel where you could click on any given object or frame in your animation and write some code. So in this point, uh, we've got a stop action. And the idea is that if the stop action was placed let's just say on this frame over here then your animation would stop at that point of time um, of course you could do far more elaborate things and string these things together to build things like games uh, this creative community uh, kind of sprung up around it and you start to see a lot of things that resemble those early crack intros and demos uh, you know little physics simulations little generative pieces fractals those types of things at uh, sort of this time, around about 2008, 2009, I had taken on my first lecturing job from industry and I was looking for a way to teach programming to multimedia students. Uh, I had my issues with Flash though, namely it was expensive, it was proprietary and it didn't have Linux support. And maybe it focused on a bit too much stuff that wasn't just programming, like there was animation and all these other things. And I just wanted to teach creative students the ideas behind programming so that they could go on to do different things with code. So I looked around and I found something called processing, which was kind of really surging at that point in time. And what it gives you is this free editor that you can kind of just download that has within it um, everything you kind of need to immediately start running, writing code and running it. And basically you type whatever you want, you hit the play button and you get visual output. So uh, it's open source, it's multi-platform, uh, and it's all kind of bundled together. You download the IDE, there's no fiddling around with choosing an editor, having to work out how to run a, a compile line or anything like that. It just kind of runs. And also, a lot of libraries have been developed for processing, so you can connect it to things like Arduino, or experiment with physics, or video processing, and, and really a whole bunch of other things. So, um, just some sort of inspiration, some ideas of what you can do with processing. I think uh, this website over here, which is generativegestalting.de, uh, is a website that accompanies this book called Generative Design. And it has a whole bunch of little sketches over here. Sketches are basically processing programs. And the idea is you can get a very good sense of all of the different things you can do with processing because it has all of these simple examples, which are obviously covered in the book as well. 
Uh, another good website to look at is Fathom. Uh, Casey Reese and Ben Fry are the two creators of Processing, and one of them is actually running this company, which is, produces a lot of data visualizations. So not necessarily using Processing, but a whole bunch of really cool stuff that you can play with in your web browser to explore data. Um, there's plenty of examples, but I'll mention this one as well. Uh, variable I.O., um, a lot of generative type of stuff. And uh, I think one project which is pretty cool is this one for book covers. Basically an algorithm that generates book covers for a whole catalog of books using different metadata. So each of these book covers is generated using things like the uh, page count, of course the author's name, the title but in addition to that um, the data was published and so on and so on to create a lot of unique covers um, one of my hang-ups about using Java in 2008 2009 as a programming fundamentals course uh, platform was that it was in Java not that I have any problems with Java but it didn't dovetail nicely with what the students wanted to do further down the line and I started looking around for processing alternatives uh, I was keen on anything with Python because I think it's great for teaching, especially as a first language. And Ruby and JavaScript were going to be something that my students encountered further along the line. So I was pretty open to those as well. So I did some research. I found this thing called Drawbot, which was uh, kind of a Python version of processing, which was neat. Uh, unfortunately, it was Mac only. Uh, I also looked at this thing over here, which was Nodebox. Also really neat, an editor, you can go and write some code and out pops all this visual output. But again, Mac only. So I looked further and I found this uh, Shoebox, which um, is basically um, a multi-platform version of Nodebox. And uh, I used this for this course and it worked really well. I was really happy with it. I actually bundled it all kind of together with an editor and everything so students could kind of just open it up and run it without having to install anything and it was a successful course uh, as i said this was about 2009 and 2010 i returned to industry uh, and i worked mainly as a front-end developer uh, and as a designer in some capacity as well in 2015-2016 i returned to lecturing and what i was tasked with doing was a programming fundamentals course again so I took a look at the processing website to see what had happened over the years and lo and behold, a new Python mode had appeared. Uh, someone had developed it and I thought this would be a good solution to what I needed to do. Uh, to give you an idea of what Python mode looks like, it's basically the normal processing editor, but over here you have a dropdown where you can choose your mode and from there, if you haven't yet, you can install and select Python and then you get to write all the stuff you would usually do in processing except using Python syntax. So you can see an example over here, a size function to control the width and height of the display window, a background color and hexadecimal, uh, and then a whole bunch of circles with different fills to, con uh, to construct this rainbow with concentric rings. So uh, there are a couple of caveats that I should mention about processing's Python mode. A, it's not actually Python, it's using something called Jython, which basically it takes all of your Python code and translates it into Java, which works pretty well. However, you can only use pure Python libraries. Anything with C uh, bindings is, is problematic. So if you wanted to use something like NumPy, you cannot. Um, Jython also at the moment is uh, at Python 2.7. Um, so Python 3 libraries aren't necessarily going to work with it. So that might also not be another limitation. Um, but the nice thing about Jython is it means that you're getting pure processing. All of your Python commands are being translated to Java, which is exactly what processing uses, which means that you have access to all of processing's environment and libraries. I've done a couple of experiments with it when I first kind of picked it up and decided to use it for my course. This over here is actually a kind of port, uh, or sort of my own take on something from a Nodebox script, uh, which you can check out on the Nodebox website if you want to see what the original one looked like. 
but basically it uses something called the super formula to generate these different shapes. And then by adding a whole bunch of randomized eyes and hair and other things to it, you get these water bear type creatures. And the idea is that every time you run the program, it generates different versions of these creatures. Um, I set up the course, uh, basically a 12 week course, and I wrote a lot of documentation, which you can find on my blog at tabreturn.github.io or add hash processing hyphen reverse to the end of that to list just the entries that are applicable to processing Python mode. Um, it's probably about eight book chapters worth of content. Uh, this is just the very first lesson. Uh, you can take a look through that if you're keen on using it for your own courses or of course for learning processing's Python mode. I also cover a whole bunch of other areas uh, that are applicable to actually learning how to write processing Python code. Um, for example, how computers deal with randomness, how they deal with color, uh, concepts around data visualization, and other things that basically complement um, using a creative coding environment like processing's Python mode. Um, if you want to check out all of the um, source code for the tasks that I cover in those books. You can look at my GitHub repository and the repo's name is tabreturn.github.io slash processingpy, just to give you an idea of what I cover there. Um, lesson one is basically just taking a look at drawing and processing. Lesson two is basically using Bezier curves. Lesson three is control flow, but also things around randomness and how computers deal with randomness and lesson four is how to actually animate in processing as well as using trigonometry for things like periodic motion and also review some stuff about using matrices for transformation operations and then in week five it's a whole bunch of stuff about data visualization so using uh, external data like csv uh, in processing to generate data viz uh, week six, looking at pixels, basically how processing can deal with pixels, uh, writing your own filters using image kernels, things like that. Week seven is interactivity, so how to build interfaces, how to draw on processing, and also a simple little game. And then I'm still writing these chapters, but week eight is looks at functions. Week nine looks at using vectors to create this simulation. Week 10 looks at physics, and then I'm also in the future planning to get into a lesson where you write your own 3D renderer but also look at processing 3D capabilities. Um, <clears throat> this is some of my student work. Basically an identicon generator uses IP addresses to generate different butts. Um, this over here is a project where they had to come up with a currency. So basically think of some fictional scenarios, sci-fi, fantasy, whatever, and think about that society and the currency they might use and then write a program to generate it. The nice thing about this is even if students aren't really strong with programming, they can use their drawing abilities to make the stuff look good. So this doesn't do much uh, in the way of impressive coding, but by using sort of impressive pictures, you get nice results. Uh, there's another example. And um, I think just to close off, what's next for processing's Python mode? Well, the project's in maintenance. Uh, it should be compatible with future versions of processing. And um, maybe Jython will move to Python 3 support, in which case you're looking at Python 3 in processing uh, Python mode, but I don't know what's going to happen there. That said, I think Python 2.7 works really well for teaching beginners. And my students go on to learn Python 3 applications in later years, and they don't really notice the difference because at beginner level, they're not seeing those technical differences between Python 3 and Python 2. Uh, and of course, Java is going to be around for a long time to come, so I don't think processing is going to go anywhere. Uh, another thing to look at is some interesting developments. P5, which is a Python, pure Python library, which attempts to recreate processing. Uh, it's pure Python. It works with Python 3 libraries. Um, but of course, because it's just a Python library, it doesn't have an editor, it doesn't have an IDE, but what you can do is if you want to take a look and play around with P5 is you can use something like Thonny, which is a beginner kind of Python IDE, which comes with Python and everything kind of all bundled into this one little click thing that you can run and then start writing code. 
And what you can do from there is you can install P5 as a package, and then you essentially land up with a processing-esque kind of environment that's using Python with sort of um, this, this P5 implementation of the processing API. Uh, it does have its limitations, it's coming along. Um, obviously, you're not hooking into that huge processing environment, so you don't have that rich set of libraries and support that, that you do with Python mode. Um, Shoebot is also something to keep an eye on. I know the guys are still developing that. And um, I am planning, oh, well, actually, I will be releasing a book on processing Python mode uh, in the very near future. So if you are interested, you can check out No Starch, that's the publisher. Uh, it should appear in the listing pretty soon. I'd love to chat more about Python mode uh, and I'm open to any questions. So thank you for listening. Will do. Okay, so the question over here is why did I decide on Python mode rather than P5.js? Um, as um, AO has, ALO, I think that's how you pronounce it, has pointed out, um, it's got a lot of libraries as well. Um, so for me, uh, I think the, the main reason I chose Python mode is because it's Python, quite simply. Uh, I'm pretty keen on teaching students to program in Python as kind of their first language. And then also um, with, the, with the course and the degree that I'm kind of working in, um, uh, the students have to encounter Python again further along because it comes up in uh, other stuff they do. Um, but I use it for, 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 for the, the back-end web course uh, and, and also some stuff around machine learning. Uh, so it, it's kind of just dovetails well and it fits in really nice. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I, I know people get into big debates and wars about um, what language is best, but for me, uh, Python, Python works really well. Um, I'm assuming you know the differences between Python and JavaScript, at least on kind of a, on a basic level. Um, cool. Um, I, I suppose I'm, I might add while I'm at it, like one of the things I find really useful is that if, we, if we're writing JavaScript, um, then, I don't know, I find students when they start writing code tend to be pretty messy. Um, I tend to get a lot of stuff that might look like, you know, like this. And then a lot of the time they'll kind of call me around and I've got to take a look at what's wrong with their code and I spend like half my time just re-indenting everything so I can kind of read it. Um, and one of the things I like about Python is that if they're going to write any code, white space is, you know, Python is white space sensitive. So um, it kind of just forces them to go and like indent everything properly, um, which, yeah, from, from my point of view, uh, saves me a lot of time. Um, and having to like kind of force them to, to code properly, if that kind of makes sense. Cool. Um, differences between P5 and Shubot. Um, so P5, uh, I, are you talking about P5, the Python mode, P5, ALE, or P5, JS, Python mode? Or... Okay, so I'm going to assume that's, that's P5, the, the Python mode. Um, they're, 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 different, they're different APIs. Um, so basically, all of the function names and the whole way that they've... Um, okay, put it this way. Shubot has tried to replicate Nodebox, whereas P5 has tried to replicate processing. So all of the function names that you get in P5 were modeled off all of the function names and features that you get in processing, whereas all of the functions that you have in Shubot are modeled on something other than processing. So it basically just means that if um, someone is familiar with processing, they're going to be able to slip into using P5 a lot more easily than they would, uh, let's just say, Shubot. 
the other thing about Shubot is that's quite interesting is it's it's kind of natively vector based. So underneath the hood, um, it's using Cairo, which is is kind of a vector engine, uh, which is pretty handy if you're trying to output SVGs. It kind of does that natively, whereas you have to do a, a bit more work to to kind of get um, processing to produce vector output. Um, cool, another one, question from East. Why do you choose to use processing says P5 Python rather than just vanilla with libraries? So um, are, are you, I'm assuming in, in this question you're saying, uh, why not just use plain old Python and then stick in some library and start to get them writing Python code? Um, so I'll answer the question like that. Um, the, thing, the thing I like about um, using something like processing is it, it has an immediacy about it. There's just one thing that you download. Uh, it's multi-platform and all that kind of stuff. And immediately you can open it up and you can start writing code. And on top of that, all of the code that you write is going to produce visual output. So if I wanted to draw, uh, let's just say a rectangle, uh, let's just do a quick rectangle function there. Uh, immediately it's kind of working, I've got a rectangle. There's no having to learn how to use the command line. Uh, there's no having to go, okay, well, we're gonna use this editor to write code and we're gonna use this library to generate the graphics and we need to kind of put all this kind of stuff together. Um, it's kind of just this one download that all the students can find. Uh, for whatever computer they're working on and immediately open it and immediately start writing code. So for me, that's that's why I, I chose it over the vanilla stuff. Um, that said, remember that a lot of the students that I'm teaching are creative students. This is not a computer science degree. So the easier and the more visual and straightforward I can make things, the better it is. It's already a bit of a hard sell trying to um, get a bunch of students who enrolled in design degrees and, and arts degrees and that to, to learn to program. So um, I, I wanna keep it kind of as non-technical as possible, or at least kind of um, trick them into getting into the technical stuff further down the line and start them off easy. Um, Has Cairo been considered to be replaced by a faster vector rendering library? Um, to be honest, I, I'd have to look at what they're doing with the uh, Shubot project. I, I'm not totally up to date with it. Uh, if I remember correctly, it might still have a, a Cairo dependency. I'm not sure, but you'd, ha you'd have to check that out. Um, a, a lot of my knowledge about Shubot is from 2000 and 2011. Uh, another question from East. Do you find that later in the education they get from, confused between processing Pi and using libraries? Um, no, uh, because I think the purpose of my course is to teach them how to program it, it's it's kind of it goes beyond any given language it's it's to teach them how to think algorithmically um to introduce them to all these sort of com computer science type concepts and then they'll go on to do other types of things so so the purpose of the course uh, uh yeah it, it's to teach them how to think like programs basically uh, and there's going to be two or three other languages that they have to use in the degree anyhow so there's no way I can keep everything Python all the way through. Um, so kind of with that in mind, it's like, okay, well, what is the, the nicest way to learn it? And I found Python mode works really well for processing. Would you recommend a workflow of tools to cut clean slash make sprites for, or graphic items from pen and paper? any images and processing. I'm just thinking. Um, I know that there are libraries for sprite sheets. Um, so uh, like if I check out the processing website, 
Um, there's, a, I think there's at least one Sprite, Sprite library. Uh, so there's this one over here. Um, I, I, no, I've never, I've never tried anything like this, um, but perhaps there could be something where you use some kind of a tile editor. Um, I'm, I'm guessing you're familiar probably with, with different tile editors, um, but there are a bunch out there. I'm just trying to think of the last one I used. Tile map, I think was one I used years ago, um, but maybe you could combine you know, something where students use a web camera and then get the stuff coming through tiled and then maybe use a sprite library to do things. Um, I'm guessing you could at least prefabricate or put together some kind of a basic structure uh, and then get them working with those tools. But to be honest, I've never, never tried anything like that. Um, I, can, I can run through, uh, uh, do you use Python system libraries? Um, yeah, you, you can, um, so from, uh, me, myself, uh, me, myself, himself, sorry, <laughs> uh, do you use Python system libraries for hardware connectivity? Um, I don't know what type of hardware you're trying to connect to, uh, but there are Arduino libraries for processing. So if you want to do anything where you, you, you know, you want to work with Arduino to build custom hardware or anything like that, uh, there's a couple of different Arduino libraries that you can connect to processing. So that's an option for, for hardware. I actually, I did a, it's, it's really rough, um, but I tested something like this a while back. Uh, I made a repository for it. Um, uh, where basically um, I had this thing that just makes like randomized versions of Pong. And then uh, we gave the students Arduino boards that had potentiometers on them where they could kind of fiddle around and, and come up with different ways to, to control the paddles in Pong. Um, and that over there uses the, it is obviously an Arduino program, but it also uses um, the Arduino library for, for processes to make this work. Um, so ALE, what are the outputs of P5? Sorry, I, I'm just, what, what do you mean by outputs? Like, are you saying, like, can you make animations? Can you make graphics? What, what do you mean by outputs? Oh, where do you see the image? Oh, okay. Uh, so I don't know if you're familiar with processing, but um, so here's, this is processing right here. If I want to make a new sketch, um, I can start with like a size function and I can say over here, I want it to be like, let's just say 500 pixels by 500 pixels. And then what happens is as soon as I run the sketch, I get an empty canvas. And then the idea over here is that I can start to add things to that using various functions. And there's all sorts of functions for drawing whatever you want. Uh, so for example, if I wanted to draw a circle, uh, I could go over here and say a circle at 10, 10 on the X, 10 on the Y, 10 uh, in size. And what's gonna happen over here is I get a tiny little circle. And then from here, you can actually do other things. So there's, for example, functions where you can like save a frame. So the idea behind this is you could save that as let's just say um, circle.jpg and then you get a JPEG out of it. Um, but that said, uh, you can also do animation and processing. So it does, just because I'm putting out static images over here, uh, don't think that it's not capable of animation. There's a whole animation uh, kind of system to it that, that you use pretty often. Uh, myself himself, do you struggle on teaching the basic mathematics needed by students in order to create, um, oh, sorry, in order to make basic graphics animation slash layout? Uh, no, not really. I think most of what they need to understand to get processing working is how to deal with X and Y coordinates. Um, and then from there, adding to them, subtracting from them is pretty easy. I think the most mathematical stuff I usually get into is stuff around trigonometry. Um, so 
uh, I, I do some stuff on, on how to generate different types of periodic motion. And um, yeah, that's probably about as mathematical as it gets. And then I do touch on some stuff about matrices, but then I immediately show them after uh, I've shown them what matrices are, that processing has built-in functions for that. So they don't really have to tackle it if they don't want to. Um, but it, it, I suppose it depends what course you, you're trying to do. Um, for me, I'm, I'm trying to avoid the mathematical stuff as I can. Uh, Any other questions from uh, DJ, oh, sorry, um, PA, uh, so does all P5 libraries are binded to Python? Um, the P, sorry, I'm just trying to understand this question. All P5 libraries, um, Yeah, so are you I'm assuming you're talking about uh, P5 Pi. Um, so, I mean, I'll show you that quickly. Um, P5 is pure Python. So any library that you want to use with it in Python will work fine. Uh, oh, is no, P5, this is P5 over here. This is a pure Python library. It's, it's basically like they've rewritten processing in Python. Whereas uh, with Python mode, all of these libraries over here should work. There are some that don't, but generally speaking, I think I've gotten every single one of them working that I've ever tried in uh, Python mode for processing. The only issue is sometimes you'll find that, for example, if I look at the examples over here, uh, that the documentation for the Python stuff isn't as thorough as the Java documentation. Uh, if you know a bit of Python and you know a bit of Java, you can usually work on how to translate them quite successfully. Uh, a good example of that is um, in the in the notes that that I've written. Um, I've got one thing that uses over here a um, a library for interface like GUI widgets uh, called Control P5. Now this over here was actually written for the Java mode in processing. Um, but I, it's, it's fairly easy to get it working in the Python mode. Uh, and yeah, I, I had no problems kind of using every single function in it, just fine. Uh, and then moving down, another question from ALE with P5, not with Python mode and processing. Or the same. Uh, okay, so I'm just assuming, going back to the ALE question, um, I assume that the with P5, not with Python mode and processing is a follow on from the question, where do you see the image? Uh, so I'm assuming that if you're using something like P5, um, you wanna know where that image pops up. Um, <clears throat> in that case, it's gonna pop up in a window. Uh, and the same if it's an animation or anything like that. Um, it basically just spawns a new window and you'll see the graphic in there. And just the same as processing mode, you can save that or do whatever you like. Uh, sorry, so. Um, the output of P5 exactly. Sorry, are, are you saying like, I'm not quite sure I follow that question. Uh, ALE, the output with P5. Okay, cool. Um, another question from myself himself, Q&A. Do Python implementations of processing core processing Java code or processing compiled shared library or any, um, uh, to be honest, I'm actually not sure. Um, Yeah, I, I couldn't answer that question. Uh, another question, uh, is there a trend of students or users dropping Java or 
JavaScript progressively for Python? I mean, what will be the preferred language for design students now or soon for processing or overall? Um, <laughs> yeah, I think that depends who you ask. Um, I think, yeah, I know a lot of computer science schools have moved from Java to Python. Uh, in, in the design space, there's never really been an established language, I would say. Uh, if anything, processing kind of made the biggest splash in design. Uh, and because it was based in Java, uh, a lot of students might have learned Java from that. But also the, the uh, JavaScript mode um, is, is very popular as well. And I think that JavaScript dovetails quite nicely with other things that design students might do. So it might come up again when they're doing stuff for web or something like that. I'm not sure. Um, but it seems like a pretty diverse landscape now. Uh, a lot of my students, for example, go on to take courses in game programming. And if they're doing game programming, they're probably not writing Python and they're probably not writing JavaScript. So um, who knows what they're going to encounter next. Uh, so I think to come back to what I said earlier, like when I decided what I wanted to use for my course, I figured um, what's going to work best with my students further down the line. In other words, I want a language that they might encounter again. And what would be the best language I feel to teach a first time programmer to write code? Uh, and for me, I feel that Python is the, the nicest first language someone can learn. Um, I should probably add, if, if no one is familiar with processing, uh, there is going to be a workshop on it later today. So I think, I think that's probably going to be in the Java mode. I'm not sure. Uh, but yeah, if you haven't tried out processing before, I'd strongly recommend you attend that. And then it's pretty easy to switch to the Python mode if you're keen. Uh, in terms of, uh, so DJ, in terms of performance, is it stable, usable for real-time video stuff and that? Um, it depends what you want to do. Um, in, in my experience, if you want to do any type of video processing in processing, it's going to be quite slow. So what I've done in the past is like, like I, I did show you that you can do all sorts of stuff to manipulate pixels. Um, so what I've done before is I've basically, uh, written programs that output a whole bunch of frames and then I just uh, you know pack all those frames into a video using something like FFmpeg afterwards so that way I'm using processing to kind of pre-render stuff if that kind of makes sense to you and then what comes out the other end can run at full speed because I just take a series of JPEGs and put them into a video so I would say if you're going to do like real-time video stuff it might not be up to the task, but if you want to do stuff where you're kind of processing and then rendering the video sort of through processing, so to speak, um, you should be okay. Um, and then generative, not hardcore 3D. Um, yeah. What is the fastest implementation of processing? Um, probably the Java mode, I would assume, because I, 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 I suspect that the processing mode that runs in the browser isn't as quick. Um, but that said, because the all the Python stuff is getting compiled into Java somehow by Jython, I would assume that Python sketches run as quickly as Java sketches, I would imagine. Uh, but maybe that's something that's a bit beyond what I can answer. Uh, there's also a Ruby version of processing that's subsequently been rebranded as JRuby Art. I can't comment how fast that is. If you want like real, real power, like you want to do processing type of work, but you want like high, high performance, then you might actually want to look beyond processing. 
uh, I would recommend something like Open Frameworks, um, which is C++. So I don't know if you're familiar with Open Frameworks, um, but yeah, this over here is gonna give you generally more performant kind of stuff than what you can get out of processing. And uh, I, I wouldn't wanna use it for a beginner course for designers learning to program. But personally, if I was doing some pretty demanding type of output, I'd probably look at something like that. Um, another one that's pretty good that's come out recently is Open Render, Open Render which is pretty good, uh, pretty powerful as well. And it's written in Kotlin. So if you're um, familiar with Kotlin, which is kind of like a, a Java kind of variant, um, this is pretty impressive as well. Uh, another one, what's the API for saving video output within processing? So there is no API. Um, I basically just save a whole bunch of frames as JPEG or PNG or whatever in a big folder and then use FFmpeg just to sort of stick them all together in a video. Uh, where do you get processing uh, inspiration for processing art? Um, uh, there's a lot of great stuff out there. Uh, I'm trying to think, I think creativeapplications.net is a really good place to look for inspiring projects in this kind of domain. Uh, so it's not necessarily processing, some of it might be processing, but generally speaking, it's all so sorts of um, creative coding applications. And a lot of the time that's hardware as well, um, but I would probably go to this website and take a look at a lot of the projects in there. Uh, I think that's a great place to start looking for some, some interesting and inspiring uh, creative code pieces. Uh, if you want a really inspiring project that I saw a long time ago, um, you can go to Cinemetrics. Um, this is kind of an interesting one. It was written in pure Python. Uh, well, not pure Python, should I say. It wasn't used in processing or anything like that. Um, but basically, it's um, something for visualizing uh, movies. So what this actually does is it goes and retrieves all the um, chapter data from DVDs and then creates these fingerprint things which represent um, what's happening in each scene of the movie. So I'm gonna go to something like a bit more obvious, like um, let's just say, I'm assuming you might've seen Solaris. So uh, the Tarkovsky um, sci-fi, quite a slow film, but you can see in, in the early parts of the film, there's a lot of action. And then uh, there's certain parts where it's kind of slow. And I think each one of these slices represents 10 shots um, and the idea is you can visualize all sorts of different things here, like this is a soccer match. So you can see lots of action and then all the types of colors you'd expect to see in a soccer match. Um, here's the matrix. Um, I can switch this to chapter colors so I can see how the, the, the colors change during the film. Um, but uh, yeah, pretty neat, pretty neat example. And it, it's from way back. Um, I think this project's about 10 years old. Uh, yeah, and I'm still like pretty inspired by it. I still show it to my students today uh, just to show them what you can do. And there's also a video on it um, where the, the, the creator's actually gone and um, put it all together in a, a short little clip that kind of shows you a comparison of, of what it does. Um, so yeah, that, that's pretty cool to see as well. Um, yeah, uh, I don't know why it's not working, but All right, thanks everyone for listening. And uh, yeah, if you wanna reach out to me afterwards or at some other point in time, I'd be very happy to talk. Thanks for watching.